So traditionally, buying shares of ETFs is a great and flexible way to invest for the long term. For example, if you wanted to invest in the S&P 500, you could just go into your trading platform and start buying shares of SPY. And given how low the fees are on behalf of the investor for buying shares of SPY, and also due to the fact that the fund itself, which created and maintains SPY, is actually investing capital in the individual stocks within the S&P 500, that's why this ETF is such a great long-term investment, right? Because those two things essentially allow the price fluctuations of SPY to almost exactly mirror the fluctuations of the actual S&P 500 index. And of course, because you cannot actually buy shares of the real S&P 500 index, right? It's simply just a number. Again, that's why the SPY ETF is a good proxy for that and still provides a way to invest in the S&P 500. Now, that being said, not all ETFs make for good long-term investments. SPY is a good investment because, again, number one, the fees are very low. And then two, the fund itself, which operates SPY, actually invests its capital into the actual stocks within the S&P 500. So unlike SPY, other ETFs actually are comprised of the futures contracts on the underlying product. So for example, USO is an ETF that tracks the crude oil market, but the fund itself does not actually invest its capital in physical barrels of crude oil. It actually puts its capital in the futures contracts on crude oil. And same thing with UNG. That's an ETF that tracks the natural gas market, but the fund itself actually puts its capital into the futures contracts on natural gas. And so now bringing this full circle, if you're not aware, last week, at the time I'm recording this video, last week, there is a brand new, I believe, first ever Bitcoin ETF that you can now start trading. And the ticker symbol for that ETF is BITO. And this ETF is no different than UNG or USO. So the fund itself, which actually created and maintains BITO, they actually invest, I believe, 96% of their capital into Bitcoin futures contracts. And then the remaining 4% or so, that actually goes into buying actual Bitcoin. Now, before I continue here, in case you are unaware of what futures contracts are, they're actually very similar to options. So they're basically contracts between a buyer and a seller that allow the two parties to trade some underlying product for a predetermined price at some point in the future, hence the name futures contracts. And that predetermined price is basically the price that the contract was bought and sold for. And also the price of that futures contract is going to be very close to the actual price of Bitcoin itself, right? For instance, if the price of one Bitcoin was, let's say $60,000, then the price of a Bitcoin futures contract is also going to be very close to $60,000. And those two things are going to fluctuate very closely to each other. So ultimately, if I went to my trading platform here and I bought one futures contract on Bitcoin, let's say the expiration date was a month from now, and the price at which I bought that contract for was $60,000. So that means if I held that contract all the way to the expiration date, I would have to buy five full Bitcoins for $60,000 per coin. So again, the price I locked in for the futures contract today is the price I will pay for five full Bitcoins one month in the future. And the reason why it's five Bitcoins is simply because that's the full notional value of the contract, right? One Bitcoin future always equates to five actual Bitcoins. Okay, so now that I've set the stage in terms of what this new Bitcoin ETF is and also a little bit about how futures work, now we're going to dive in and I'll show you why this new Bitcoin ETF is not a good long-term investment. And in fact, also why any ETF, which is comprised mostly of futures contracts, is also not a good investment either. And as you'll see in a minute here, once we jump over to my computer, the main reason why futures-based ETFs are not good investments has to do with a concept called Contango. And I'll explain exactly what that is and how it works. But as always, before I do so, in case this is the first video of mine you've come across, my name is Scott Reese and welcome to my channel where I'm here to help you learn how to trade, invest, and master your finances so you can apply that knowledge in the real world and multiply your money. And if you want to see more trading or investing content after watching this video, you can also find me on Skillshare as well, where you can take my very in-depth classes on options trading or stock market investing. And I provided some links to some of the introductory courses of mine in the description of this video below. So be sure to check them out. And when you sign up for Skillshare using any of those links, you'll get a full one month free trial. And so with that being said, now let's jump on over to Thinkorswim here and we'll get things started. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a chart of the Bitcoin futures contracts, not the actual coin itself, but specifically the Bitcoin futures contract expiring in the October expiration cycle. 
And the way you can tell that this is indeed a futures contract is by looking at the ticker symbol, which for futures always begins with a forward slash. So forward slash BTC, that represents Bitcoin futures. And again, these financial products, all they allow you to do is trade Bitcoin for a predetermined price at some point in the future. So therefore, these contracts trade pretty much exactly like the actual Bitcoin itself. But there are still a few key subtle differences that make the Bitcoin ETF, which is comprised mostly of these futures contracts, not a good long term investment. And the major difference or the major problem with the Bitcoin futures has to do with the concept of contango. Now, what is contango? Well, let's come over to the trade tab here and take a look at the actual prices for all these futures contracts. So over here in the symbol column, these are the ticker symbols for each specific futures contract expiring in a particular month. So forward slash BTC V21. This corresponds to the Bitcoin futures contract expiring in October. The month code for October is V. Don't ask me why. It's just the way it is of 2021. And again, you can see the expiration over here in this column, October 2021. And then, of course, the next contract expires in November, then December, January, February, and so on and so forth. Now, getting back to the concept of contango, what does that mean? Well, it simply means that a futures price for some commodity or some product is greater than the spot price. And the spot price for the underlying product is simply the current trading price for the product itself. So, for example, if I come over here to Robinhood, and if you were to look up the actual Bitcoin itself, just BTC, no forward slash, this is the actual coin that you can buy or sell, right? The current trading price for Bitcoin at 59880 bucks. this is the spot price. This is the current price for the actual physical product, Bitcoin. And ideally for a Bitcoin ETF to actually be a good choice for a long-term investment, the ETF should be composed mostly of the actual Bitcoin itself. But unfortunately, the Bitcoin ETF, BITO, is composed almost entirely of the Bitcoin futures contracts. I believe it's like 96% of the ETF is just Bitcoin futures. And the remaining 4% or so is the actual Bitcoin. So now that I've explained what spot price is, take a look at the prices of these futures contracts going further out in time. Right, the current active month of October, the last price that got filled from Friday for one of these contracts was $60,810. Then for the November contract, it went up to 61430 Then for December, the last price was 62185 and so on and so forth. So the further out in time you go, the more expensive these contracts become. This is what Contango is. Now, unfortunately, the futures market is closed right now, so that's why you're not seeing any prices change here. But like I was saying earlier, the prices of these contracts do follow pretty closely the actual spot price of Bitcoin itself. So obviously, as you can see here, Bitcoin actually trades 24-7, I believe, seven days a week. So again, if the futures market was open over here, you would see these prices fluctuating in a very similar fashion. But still, the prices of all these futures contracts would remain greater than the spot price of Bitcoin, right? No matter where Bitcoin goes over the next few seconds, minutes, days, or weeks, the prices of these futures contracts will always be a bit greater. And by increasing amounts, the further out in time you go. Now, why is this the case? Why is Contango a thing in the futures market? Well, if we come over here to this Investopedia page, there's actually a variety of reasons why Contango may exist. Now, the main reason is usually, as you can see here, the premium above the current spot price for a particular expiration date is usually associated with the cost of carry. Now, this mostly applies to actual physical products like commodities, gold, silver, wheat, oil, corn, etc. Because think about it, if a buyer and a seller are agreeing to exchange a futures contract for, let's say, December, that means the seller of that futures contract has to hold that physical product in storage until December, right? Because only at that point are the buyer and seller of the futures contract actually going to then exchange the physical underlying product. And depending on that physical product, there might indeed be some storage costs, right? It's not free to store wheat, for example or it's not free to store barrels of oil. So these storage costs or any costs that come with maintaining the actual physical product go into the cost of carry. Now for Bitcoin, however, it's a digital asset. So really there's not a cost of carry in this fashion. But if we come down here, you can see there are also other causes of contango mentioned here as well, including inflation expectations, price inflation expectations for Bitcoin in this case, or expected future supply disruptions, 
carrying costs, as I said earlier. Also, interest rates are a huge factor as well. And so in regards to Bitcoin, I would say the main reason for Contango is due to expected price inflation, right? Obviously, there's a lot of people out there who are bullish on Bitcoin and are willing to pay a bit more for a futures contract further out in time because their assumption is Bitcoin by that time will be much, much higher. But that's only my assumption. There is no way to for sure with 100% certainty tell why there is indeed Contango for Bitcoin futures. So now this begs the question of why is Contango even a problem for this Bitcoin ETF? Well, the big deal has to do with all these expiration dates. Because let's say, for example, the Bitcoin ETF right now has most of its futures holdings in the November cycle. So that means the actual fund itself that operates the BITO ETF has to actually go out and purchase a lot of these November contracts in order to maintain the functionality of the ETF, right? Because the ETF is supposed to follow pretty closely the fluctuations of Bitcoin. So if that's the case, then eventually these futures contracts are going to expire. And come the actual expiration of a futures contract, that's when the buyer and seller of the contract would have to exchange the actual Bitcoin itself at the price that the futures contract was initially bought and sold for a long time ago. But the fund does not want to do that, right? The ETF is supposed to continually maintain a futures position. Specifically, it's supposed to maintain almost an entirely futures-based position to continue operating the ETF. And so that's where the concept of rolling comes into play. And that simply means as the November expiration comes closer, eventually the fund is gonna have to sell all the November futures contracts that it owns. It's going to sell out all the Novembers and then buy all the Decembers. And that has the effect of simply extending the duration of that futures position. And then, of course, once the December expiration date comes pretty close, then the fund is going to sell out all of their December contracts and replace them with January contracts and then so on and so forth. But the major issue here with doing this is the fund will always have to do this for a loss because the prices of these further out expirations are always going to be more expensive. So again, going back to our first example with right now, let's say the fund is mostly holding November futures contracts. And let's pretend for a second, let's fast forward in time to when they're going to roll out the contracts to December. Well, if the fund has to sell all their November contracts for a price of, let's say, 61430 and then buy all new contracts for 62185 that's obviously going to be a loss. Specifically, let's figure out in terms of a percentage here. And so 62185 minus 61430 there's a difference in price there of $755. And if we divide this by the November price of 61430 and then finally multiply by 100 to get it into a percentage terms, that means there's going to be a 1.23% drag for the ETF between November and December. So that means the actual price of the ETF itself, BITO, will underperform Bitcoin between these two months by about 1.23%. And in fact, if you were to do the same calculation between the prices of all these futures contract expirations, you would get a pretty similar number around, call it 1.2 to 1.3% or so. So that means on an annualized basis over one full year, this ETF is going to drastically underperform the actual Bitcoin itself. And in fact, let's come over here to this second article I have pulled up. This is from Coindesk, and the title of this article is Why a Bitcoin Futures ETF Could Be a Bloody Ride. And the one thing I want to point out in this article, let's scroll down here a little bit. So this Charlie Morris of ByteTree Asset Management performed those similar calculations I just showed you and found that the current roll cost on Bitcoin futures on an annualized basis right now is about 17%. And then over the longer term, Charlie expects the ETF to underperform the spot price of Bitcoin by about 8.4% annually. So essentially he expects the 17 to come down at some point to about 8.4. But either number is still going to be a catastrophic hindrance on an investment in this ETF. Right, Because let's say, for example, Bitcoin goes up by 17% over the next year. That means instead of buying Bitcoin and making that 17% return, if you instead bought that ETF, you would actually make no gain for the entire year. This 17% drag is going to eat away at the gains that Bitcoin was actually making. Or a second example could be, let's say the price of Bitcoin goes up by 50% in one year. Well, that means for the ETF, because there's a 17% drag on the price of that ETF, 
that means the return for BITO is going to be 50 minus 17, which is only 33. Still not bad, but, but you are definitely underperforming Bitcoin itself by a huge amount. Moreover, let's say Bitcoin actually had a negative return for one year. Maybe Bitcoin went down by 20%. Well, that drag is still likely going to be there, which means the Bitcoin ETF is going to exacerbate the losses even more. So the annualized return of BITO would be minus 37%. So ultimately, the bottom line here is as long as Contango stays in place for Bitcoin futures, which likely will always be the case, then that means the BITO ETF will always have significant price drag. And if you invest in that ETF for a long period of time, you as the investor will dramatically underperform Bitcoin itself. So that means if you are looking to be a long-term investor in Bitcoin, you are much, much better off investing in the actual coin itself. That being said, I do want to close with one more thing here. Let's come over to BITO real quick. And of course, at the time of this video, this ETF has only been trading for four days, so the chart's a bit ugly right now. But still, if we come to the trade tab here, you can see the trading volume for this ETF just on last Friday was almost 12 million shares. Moreover, we already have a lot of option cycles on this ETF as well. And for example, if we go into the November cycle, these options are extremely heavily traded as well, right? You can see in this column with the volume for all these contracts, they're all in the hundreds. The open interest here is in the thousands, both for the call options and the put options. So the point here is that BITO is a great short-term trading vehicle, right? Obviously, Bitcoin is a very volatile product. It's great for short-term trading. And so this ETF being only about 40 bucks per share is a very cheap way to start trading Bitcoin in the short term. Or if you're like me and you pretty much exclusively trade options, then same thing. You can't trade options on Bitcoin itself, but you can trade options on the ETF. And if your trades are as short term as a single day or maybe a week or two, then the price drag is really going to be completely negligible. Right. Again, that price drag only becomes a significant issue if you're a long term buy and hold investor. And so there we go. That's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please let me know your thoughts or if you have questions in the comment section below. And don't forget, if you want to take some very in-depth classes on options trading or stock market investing, then check out my Skillshare courses. Links in the description of this video. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up, drop a comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I drop new videos every single week and you don't want to miss out. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.